Well, good morning. Last week we started the series, Jesus Said What? Last week he said, I have some bad news. Well, this week he says, I now have some good news. So just to recap on what happened last week, Jesus met with Nicodemus at night discussing matters which turned into a discussion of salvation. Jesus says, I got some bad news for you, Nicodemus. You must be born again. And we closed on a story of Moses or the bronze serpent, same as the Son of Man, to be lifted up and see. Now, most pastors will end a sermon with this verse. But this week, we're going to start with that verse. Now, this verse, you may not have ever heard of it. It's a very mysterious verse. And not a whole lot of people know this one. It is John 3, 16. That, that, that was intended as a joke. Of course, this is a, the most popular Bible verse in the entire Bible. I mean, you see it everywhere on billboards, bumper stickers, Tim Tebow's eye paint when he played football. And you also see it on like little memorabilia, such as uh, Valentine's Day cards. Right here, and I have John 3.16 as a wristband and a card that says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And it gives it as a Valentine's Day card. I, we got this at uh, my kid's uh, daughter, daddy-daughter date night. And they was giving these out. And I thought that was really Really awesome with that. And what to do a side note before we get into the scripture and a little fun fact here. Some people believe that the red words stop at John 3.15. I have in my possession right here a NIV Bible. And John 3.16 in this Bible, the red letters stop at John 316. It is black. They believe John wrote this. The translators of the NIV believe that John wrote John 316 through John 321, which is contradictory of other translations. Of course, of course, back in back in the older times before red ink ever graced its presence in our Bibles, all of it was black and white. So a lot of people did not know who wrote what, unless it says, he said this, he said that. But since the Bible is Holy Spirit inspired, does it really matter who said it? No, it does not. The fact is that this is truth, Holy Spirit inspired scripture. And it is exactly, it says what it is. So, let's look at this. John three sixteen, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That love is the agape love. We learned this a couple months ago. The agape love is the only kind of love that could be, is, that could only be, be defined as the supreme self-sacrificial love. The only way this love can be um, described is what Christ done on the cross. And whoever believes in him should not. The Greek word there is may and it says will not. Whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. The interesting thing about the word believe there, it means trust, faith. Whoever puts their trust in Christ, whoever puts their faith in Christ, will not perish. Now that is a promise. This verse shows that God's love was more than a sentiment. God gave his only son as a substitute for the sins of man. When your trust is in Christ alone, the sin bearer, 
divine judgment is removed and we have everlasting life. In 1 John chapter 2, 1 through 2. My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he himself is appropriation. Propitiation. Yeah, you got it. Well, I was thinking of a different time, okay? <laughs> For our sins and not for ours only, but also the, for the whole world. John is writing to believers saying that all the world is atoned. Salvation is available if they want it. He speaks to believers as if they were children so they would not miss it. So that you may not sin. The word there means to miss the mark. Missing the bullseye. See, we are set to live a certain standard. And many of us fall short of the glory of God, which means missing the mark. We got several golfers here, so I'm going to try my best not to miss the mark on this one. But when you go up to the tee and you want to hit the ball down the fairway and try to get to the green... If you play golf with me, you will find out that I spend more time in the woods and in the lake than anywhere in the, on the golf course. Last time I went golfing, I came out with a nine-pound bass and a ten-point buck. Okay? So if we was filming the Outdoor Channel, that would be, be a great episode there. For some reason, the golfer got uh, some wall mounts. Anyway, you're wanting to make it to the green. You're wanting to be able to just sit there and just put it within, let's say, par three. You want to get there in two shots. So you're wanting to get there and not miss the mark. Do not be like me and go off into the woods somewhere, go, or go into the lake or go into the sand dunes thinking you're at the beach. But we are not to miss the mark. But even though if we do sin, we have an advocate. We have someone who stands in between us. And judgment, and that is Jesus Christ. In Matthew seven thirteen through 14. Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way to, that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. The path of salvation from the time of Christ to now has never been hidden. The life of Christ is a historical fact that Jesus did come to this earth, that he did die at the hands of Pontius Pilate, and he also was resurrected. The path of salvation is in plain sight for the world to see, but few only accept it. Few will accept the narrow way, but others don't agree with God's way of eternal life. We see this all the time in these TV, famous TV preachers, even Oprah, where they say there's a lot of ways to heaven. We see this on Joel Osteen on Larry King Live. It is not my job to judge on who finds a better way to heaven. Well, I'm so sorry. These two professing Christians claim that there's more than one way into heaven. But that goes against anything that has to do with the Christian belief. The Christian belief and the Bible says that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one can go through the Father except through him. So Jesus is the only way into heaven on the contradictory of the wide path celebrities. The legitimate way to having a relationship with God is His way through His Son, Jesus Christ. Now this next verse is probably one of my favorites and the most forgotten about Bible verses. John three seventeen. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. The word condemn there is, means to separate and to judge. 
He did not send the word, him into the world to separate them or to judge them. That will come later. But to save them. The Father's purpose at sending the Son, like this verse says, it was to save and not to judge. It is not the Father's will that no man will be separated from him. Yet the condemning comes to the one who do not believe in his Son. Salvation can only come from God. In Ephesians 2, 8 through 9. For by grace you have been saved through reason of, through faith. And not, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God. Not of works, lest anyone boast. The, sa- the word saved through there, the word through, means with By reason by, and by the means of. You have been saved through with faith. You have been saved by the reason of faith. And you've been saved by the means of faith. Not of works. Lest anyone boast. There is nothing we can do or nothing that we have done to get salvation. It's a gift from God. Salvation comes from God. Grace is only available through faith. And if we look at it like a like if it was a bank. If grace is something that God has deposited for you in an account. Faith is the only way you can withdraw it. It is withdrawing God's grace. So it could be made manifest in our lives. So it could be made known, made known in our lives. And it doesn't come from works. So people will be strutting around like peacocks. Has anybody ever seen a peacock? Beautiful creature. Beautiful creature. Out in the field, got his feathers flared up and everything looks like a bunch of tiny little eyeballs like the bird is just sitting there saying hey look at me look at me and you'll be sitting there saying oh what a beautiful creature what a beautiful creature then all of a sudden (laughs) then you're like shoot it At 5 o'clock in the morning, I do not want to hear this creature at my bedroom window going, Bah-gah! we are not going to do that. Same thing with a rooster. Mm-hmm. Anyway, we have peacock churches in this area around the world. You see it all the time. You have these deacons, elders who have name tags with their chest stuck out, thinking they're Barney Five. Oh, look at this, i got a badge. They're walking around like they're Barney Five, peacocking around and thinking that they are something. Well, I have news for them. They act like they are saved through the church and not saved through the blood of Jesus Christ. You will only be able to brag about your works. Or you will only be able to brag about the grace of God That which you were saved by. That is the only thing we can brag about. In Acts 19, 8 through 9. And he went into the synagogue and spoke boldly for three months. Reasoning and persuading concerning the things of the kingdom of God. And we were hardened. And they some were hardened. And did not believe. But spoke evil of the way. Before the multitude, he departed from them and withdrew with the disciples, reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. Now he, Paul, was in Ephesus, speaking boldly for three months, trying to convince them of the kingdom. The kingdom, like Jesus, was Paul's primary focus. So they became hardened and slandered the Christian belief which moved Paul from the synagogue to the student hall. Notice how the opposition of the gospel changed the venue, but bared more fruit. 
God knows how to take the deeds of the wicked and use them to accomplish his good purposes. Now the picture there is the what remains of that very school. In John 3, 18, verse 20 through 20. He who believes in him will not condemn, is not condemned. But he who does not believe is condemned already. Because he has not believed in the same, in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So whoever rejects Jesus, who has already rejected him is already condemned. Now I see hear this question all the time. This is like the go-to move on many atheists when they want to come up and try to stump you. Why does God send people to hell? What Bible do you did you read? What Bible did you get that from? What makes you think God sends us? Well, the answer is clear here in John chapter 3. You can see it through 19 through 20. And this is the condemnation. That the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than the light. Because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light. And does not come to the light lest his deeds should be exposed. The condemnation there is almost the same word as condemned but this is separating and judgment condemned is the word for uh, future tense condemnation is the word for present tense that they are condemned already man loves their sin and everyone who practices it exercises it and performs it Hates the light. Unbelief now is really a belief of convenience. And Nicodemus here in chapter 3 was challenged to come out of the dark. Now anyone who sits there and practices it, who chases their fleshly desires, should be challenged every day on What spirit is really in them? For if you have the Holy Spirit, in Romans it tells us that the Holy Spirit gives us witness to our spirit. Um, Y'all bear with me for one second. Sorry, David. (laughs) Uh, let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4 Uh, I'll start in 3 and I'll stop whenever it's time to stop but even if our gospel is veiled it is veiled to those who are perishing it is veiled Because it is hidden from those who choose to not believe. Whose minds the gods of this age. The god of this age which is Satan. Has blinded. Who do not believe. Lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. Who is the image of God. Should shine on them. Satan's job from the beginning has always been the same. To separate people from God. And he will sit there and put a blindfold on you so you do not see the light. For we do not preach ourselves but Christ Jesus the Lord. And ourselves your bondservants for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who commanded light to shine of darkness. Who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus. So this tells you that spiritual warfare is exact, is evident. It is real. People who do not believe in Jesus. Who is hardened by this world. Has put got blinders on. A veil in between them and the light. We pray all the time for our eyes to be opened. And that is where it comes from. 
The enemy will try to keep the people in their sin and not look for an exit with the free gift that comes from God, which is salvation. Let's go to Second Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise. As some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. The Lord is slow. He is, he is not slow with his promise. He is long-suffering. He will sit there and wait on you. When we fulfill our responsibilities, we'll see more of God's sovereign actions. Many of us are waiting on God to act. But in reality, God is waiting on them. And waiting on us. It reminds me of that song that says, uh, God, why don't you do something? He says, I did. I created you. In 1 John 5, 14... Now this is the confidence that we have in him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. John is saying salvation is more than an eternal life. We should be doing more. This letter, this book, is about experiencing an intimate relationship with God. When our intimacy runs deep, our confidence in him grows in prayer. Now this book here, from beginning, middle, and end, it talks about how much God loves us. And the further, further into it we get, the more confident we have in our Savior, in our Lord Jesus Christ. And through studying of his word, and through continual pl- a prayer, the Continual phone calls to him. Our confidence will grow in him. And what we should ask in prayer. Now when we start a new job. Our first day on the job. We don't know what to ask or who to ask or how to ask. Certain things. Now obviously we ask how to do the job and how to do it safely. But other things like. uh, Hey uh, can I get a day off here? Hey can I do this here? Hey what about this here? It's the same thing here. The more we grow in it, the more confident we are on how we ask and what we ask in prayer. And also, be careful what you pray for. Because when it comes true, it's out of my hands. <laughs> uh, back there, am I seeing the same thing? Am I not seeing John 3.21? As the next one. Okay. Let's hope. Good thing we have the perfect backup plan. The perfect plan. Primary and backup. All right. John 3, 21. We cannot leave this verse out. We cannot stop it where, where it is. But he who does the truth comes to the light. That his deeds may be clearly seen. That they have been done in God. The ones who have seen the truth. Who knows they need a savior. And who is walking in light and in truth. And have done the works. The works that are evidence of their faith. That what, that's what unbelievers see most of the time. They do not ask you about your faith. They ask you what have you done. And another thing that the atheists use all the time. Is the crusades and stuff. I'm sorry, those people did not do those works in the name of Christ. They done those things in the name of an evil evil pope. It was not done in the name of Christ. Unbelievers are responsible for their evil deeds, but believers know that God gets the glory for their good ones. Nicodemus was being challenged to come out of the darkness and into the light because the people in his order was doing Deeds to glorify themselves, which is considered evil deeds. If it's not of God, it's evil. 
And in Romans 7, 18. For I know that in me nothing good dwells. For to will is, in, is present with me. But how to perform what is good I do not find. Paul says I am nothing good and there's nothing that I can do can be good. Mankind knows the difference of good and evil. It's in our DNA. Because of what happened at the garden. When Adam and Eve ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Believers know all goodness comes from God. We are not good. Our de- We're n- We are not good. Our deeds without Christ is like filthy rags. So believing in Jesus who God sent to die for our sins won't make us good. But we put our faith in the one who is good. And that's how we receive our salvation. We know that we are not perfect. We can never be perfect. We can never be good. But we put our uh, trust and faith, we put our belief in Jesus Christ, the perfect, good God. And that is how we get it. Now, I want to take a stab at a question that's been bugging me for weeks and it has been uh, falsely answered since season one of The Chosen. What happened to Nicodemus? Now, we see this in John chapter 3, and we do not hear Nicodemus' answer. We do not hear what Nicodemus had to say about all these uh, truths and facts that Jesus was uh, giving him. We do not see this. And we see Nicodemus only three times in scriptures, and all three times are here in the book of John. You see this in the first time when Nicodemus was defending Jesus and his disciples, or mainly Jesus. In John seven fifty through 52, Nicodemus, the one, being, uh, the one who came into the night, so we can be clear on who it is, said to them, Does our law judge a man before it hears him and knows what he is doing? They answered to him, Are you also from Galilee? Search and look, for no prophet has risen out of Galilee. Now it tells us where Nicodemus is from, the area of Galilee. So that tells me that John, who's also from Galilee, knows this man personally. Because in the old tradition, the Hebrew children would have to grow up in the school to learn the word of God, learn Torah. And Nicodemus being the teacher and the Pharisee that he is, my money is on that he was one of the teachers there at that synagogue. For he was there in Galilee, he's from Galilee. So we now know why Matthew did not mention this this case, because Matthew did not know who Nicodemus was. Maybe. I don't know, I'm just spitting this stuff out there. So what happened to Nicodemus? Because we are left off thinking that Nicodemus never changed. He never received salvation. Because he came in the night afraid of the colleagues that he worked with. Well, in John chapter 19, 38 through 42, I'm not going to read all this. It's just going to be there for you to see. That Joseph of Arimathea, disciple of Jesus, gained permission to get the Bible, uh, body of Jesus. And Nicodemus who came by Jesus by night, so we can clarify who we're talking about, brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, a hundred pounds of myrrh and aloes. And both of them laid Jesus in the tomb. Now this brings us back to John chapter 3, verse 2, saying we know you are. You came from God. You are special. We know Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. People were worried about Nicodemus' salvation. Well, Nicodemus first came to him in night in fear, and now here he is in daytime, not afraid of his faith. So I believe, it does not say it in here, but I believe anybody who will sit there and 
do this act, really had trust and faith in the man. And he was willing to be scalded. He was willing to be beat. He was willing to be mocked to take care of Jesus Christ. And when before he would came to him in night. So it is my personal opinion and what we see the evidence here that Nicodemus did become a follower, a disciple, a saved individual for Christ. Now the question is, people at home, what are you today? Now I'm going to challenge the people at home that are on Facebook. I'm not challenging people here because you're already here. I'm going to challenge the people at home to find a local gathering. Find a local gathering of believers. If you do not like the churches in your area, start one in your living room. If you do not like what your church is teaching, start teaching it in your living room. The Bible says when two or more are gathered in his name, he will be in their midst. But find a local gathering of believers to start learning the Bible, to start teaching each other, lifting each other up. It is all about the body of Christ lifting each other up to glorify Christ and in Christ alone. Let us pray. Father God, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for your many blessings. We thank you for your precious son, Jesus Christ, who came and died on the cross for our sins. Because without him, we would have no way to you, Father. So we thank you for that. We thank you for your perfect plan, your plan of salvation that started from the beginning, and it is here now. We thank you for this. Father, we just... Pray that your Holy Spirit will come and draw people closer to you. Saved and unsaved, Lord, just draw them to you. Because it is not your desire to be separated from them. So just have your Spirit move upon your creation and draw people to you. For we ask this in your precious name. In your Son, Jesus Christ of Nazareth's name. We pray this. Amen. Thank you, Josh. If you would... Uh...